Good morning, I'm Andrew Lansley and I'm a Strategic Counsel at Lowe Associates uh, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity once again uh, to be the moderator for our uh, very interesting discussion this morning. Um, I've very much enjoyed and been fascinated by some of the contributions we've had at previous breakfast debates with the Board of Focal Point Network on a range of issues and I'm delighted we've uh, um, we're discussing the cross-border education issues today because these education issues are absolutely central to our collective future. Um, and uh, we have a, a great panel of speakers and participants today. Delighted you're joining us. Um, in the course of our discussion today, if you wish to contribute, do please look to the chat function uh, at past discussions, we've had a very lively chat function that is offering not only uh, questions to our panelists, which I will pick up and deploy during our panel discussion later, but also people are often making good points and offering interesting links so that people can see some of the connections that um, our participants uh, and our audience themselves have made over the, um, uh, on this issue. Um, can I also mention, please, um, during the course of our discussion today, in addition to the um, debates that we've already had, and this is the 10th um, Border Focal Point Network debate, it's a terrific set of discussions, but we would be very interested if you would put up on chat uh, what you think are topics that would be important and useful for the Border Focal Point Network to incorporate in future events. Uh, and if you are able to let us know how many of these debates that you have participated in, that would be very useful to know too. So please, uh, at any point during the course of our debate this morning, please put that up on chat on your behalf. Um, in addition, during the course of our discussions this morning, we are going to conduct two polls, which always enable us to hear directly from um, you, the participants, what your view is uh, on aspects of the issue under discussion. Let me just um, start the first of those polls now and I'll get to the second later on. So the first poll is to ask what in your opinion should be done to ensure access to education at cross-border level and we're asking you please to select one of these four options that you think is the most important in this respect, not to say the others may not make a contribution, but which do you think is the most significant? That is, merging of schools in border areas to ensure critical mass in the closest facility rather than within national borders. Secondly, designing cross-border education programmes with an international and a multilinguistic approach. Thirdly, promoting the integration of disadvantaged groups and minorities through joint efforts from government and development partners. And fourthly, to consolidate collaboration between cross-border local authorities in the field of education so as to create a joint training offer. So those are your four options in the first poll. Uh, and if you're able to respond to those on the chat, please. I'm, ho I'm hoping you will be able to respond to those. Uh, and I will get the answers after we've had uh, some initial remarks. I'm delighted that we are first going to hear from uh, Jean-Pierre Halkin, who is the head of the unit responsible in DG Regio for cross-border cooperation. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you with us this morning, Jean-Pierre, and I'd be very grateful if you would introduce our discussion today. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew, and uh, good morning to all of you. It's my pleasure for me to attend this first um, breakfast meeting organized by the Border Focal Point Network, and I would like to start by not only welcoming you, but also thanking my colleagues of the Border Focal Point Network for organizing uh, this series of meetings. Um, I'm working in a, in a unit which is promoting two very important elements. The first one was helping uh, the cross-border cooperation program to be implemented smoothly by uh, member states and by uh, border regions. And um, the second is that uh, since 2014, uh, we are also uh, making sure that 
the border obstacles which are impeding uh, or preventing the border regions and the citizens living in border regions to uh, reach their full potential are identified and they can be solved. So we started in 2017 with a communication on border obstacles and we continued notably in 2021 with a, a report uh, called EU Border Regions, Semicolon, Living Laps of European Integration. And I think that topic is very uh, important in today's uh, European context. And in this report, we have identified four clusters which are extremely important to uh, pave the way for a smooth and faster development of border regions. Uh, the first cluster is resilience through deeper institutional cooperation. The second is more and better cross-border public services. The third one is about vibrant cross-border labor market. And the fourth one is about border regions and the European Green Deal. <clears throat> we can see that um, ensuring fair access to um, education is totally central to two of the four uh, cluster priorities that I just mentioned, but it is also very important for four of them. And, and today, uh, what we are discussing is really a question of fairness. We want to be sure that a citizen who is living in a border region can access all training possibilities which are uh, around him or around her. That's something very important so that uh, we don't have as we've seen for roads for uh, decades or nearly centuries, that the road is ending at the border. And here the training map could be also ending at the border so that if you need a training, maybe you are prevented to have the training which is sitting just or organized just next to the border. This is very important for the worker, but it's also important for anyone who will provide the jobs, uh, being uh, an entrepreneur who wants to be sure that he has access to well-trained person, he should not be discouraged to establish his enterprise in the border region, the same for an administration. This topic is not only important for us from a conceptual point of view, it's also important for uh, the programs we are supporting. And uh, it's also very important to note that um, there are 46 cross-border cooperation programs, which in 2021, 2027, have a possibility to finance project in the area of improving equal access to inclusive and quality service in education, training, and lifelong learning. So this topic will inspire many people who are contributing to the programs. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to learn more about this topic. That's terrific, Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction and very interesting um, presentation. Um, can I turn immediately, if I may, to uh, Anne uh, Thévenet, um, who is a Deputy Director of the uh, uh, Euro Institute Strasbourg Kehl. And um, I, I know many of those who have participated in our um, breakfast discussions on the border focal point network will be very interested in the massive online open course that uh, has been taking place. I wondered if you could tell us about that and how that has gone and what the future prospects are for that. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm very happy uh, today to uh, talk to you a little bit more about the MOOC on European Territorial Cooperation. It was an initiative from DJ Ritu, and uh, I was part uh, of the consortium who worked on the MOOC, which was led um, by the University of Strasbourg and um, what you might wonder what is a MOOC it is a massive open online course it means it is an online training which is accessible uh, for free and um, our MOOC is uh, of course on European territorial cooperation it's divided into four chapters. The first one will guide you through the foundation of European territorial cooperation, its evolution and theoretical framework. The second chapter will depict the existing European policies in the field of territorial cooperation. The third one has a more thematic approach and the fourth will help you uh, uh, to know how cooperation is working uh, efficiently implemented by local stakeholders. So if you're wondering 
how uh, European territorial cooperation was born, or if you are asking yourself, what are the four strands of Interreg, or are there any other uh, interregional cooperation program, or even um, which are best practices in terms of uh, cooperation in the field of health, uh, special planning, or education, for example, or if you are wondering how to manage a cross-border project efficiently or how to uh, overcome intercultural barriers, then this MOOC is done for you and you will have the possibility uh, to take part to it. Um, I will put uh, just after the link to the MOOC into the chat, so don't hesitate to have a look. You will find uh, videos, interviews, text reads, and uh, also some quizzes in order to know if uh, if you manage to understand everything. And then you can get some certificates uh, uh, that will show you and attest that you are now an expert in uh, European territorial cooperation. So don't hesitate to take part. Our second session just opened yesterday, and it will last uh, till the mid December approximately. We already had a first uh, session, which was at the beginning of the year, and already 600 participants uh, were there. So I hope uh, to find you in the participants of this second session. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will put also my mail into the chat so that you can uh, ask any questions you want in the chat or via email. Thank you so much. And thank you very much indeed. Yes, it, indeed, it, there, there was a, um, was it March and April this year, there was a, the MOOC was open. Um, 600 participants is very good. And I imagine it's a really important thing from the point of view of many of our participants in these debates. And perhaps some of these debates that we've had have themselves directly contributed to the MOOC itself and giving examples um, that have been drawn upon. Because that's been a very important thing. Um, always to have practical examples that uh, tell practitioners how they can uh, achieve cross-border cooperation more effectively. We've, we've enjoyed hearing all those. Um, let's turn, uh, if I may, uh, before we come to the views from, uh, literally from those who are themselves practitioners in cross-border education cooperation, let's hear from our um, participants today how they have felt on the poll that we launched a little earlier. Uh, if um, my colleague Arno is able to bring up the results of the first poll, please. Uh, uh, so um, quite a strong feeling that the first and most important factor should be to design cross-border education programs with an international and multilinguistic approach. Very good, very interesting. Uh, and secondly, to the collaboration between local authorities across borders. And then um, some uh, of our colleagues felt some of the other two um, matters were possibilities, but not as important as designing education programs in that fashion. Thank you very much. Let's, let's move to the second poll, which you will have during the course of our presentations, you'll have an opportunity also to look at the second poll which likewise, please, um, you have a number of options, five options in this case, uh, and we would like you to choose one so we can see which uh, is the strongest uh, feeling. So the question is, what in your opinion would be the main advantages of pooling resources among education institutions in border regions to strive for excellent standards? That is, exchange of practices and teaching methods among territories and harmonization of those academic standards and qualifications. Diversification of providers, that is public, private, open distance learning, education, etc. Thirdly, more affordable and more, therefore more accessible education. Fourthly, better preparation of students for fast changing labor markets and increased competition. And fifthly, provision of equal opportunities and uh, greater social, intercultural and linguistic skills. So quite a range of different factors which might be um, amongst the most important in uh, raising standards. Perhaps you could choose from amongst those which you think is the most important. Let us turn one of the 
um, most important features of our discussions is to hear from those who are themselves practitioners in cross-border cooperation. And in this particular context, we're looking forward to hearing from Laura and Eniko. And first from Laura, Laura Matosh, who is a um, part of the, you are, uh, Laura, part of the Master in Border Studies at the Université de la Grande Région. And I wonder if you could tell us about cooperation uh, and the cross-border cooperation in education as you have experienced it, please. Yeah, thank you also from my part for the invitation. So I will share my screen. Okay, perfect. So uh, today I will present the uh, University of the Greater Region. And um, yeah, as it was already mentioned before, I'm a, a master's student at the Monastery in Border Studies. So I will talk today about uh, opportunities and challenges of uh, cross-border education. So, and first, uh, I want to present the University uh, of the Greater Region. So the University of the Greater Region is a network of seven universities in the border region, uh, greater region. So if you don't know where it is, you can see it now on the map. So it's uh, the region Rhineland-Palatinate in um, Germany and Saarland, as well as Grand, Grand Est in France, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg and Valonia in Belgium. And in this region, we have uh, since the 1980s cooperation in the uh, higher education. And the UniGR, so the University of the Greater Region, was born out of the Interreg program um, for A, the Greater Region. So um, yeah, in this region, University of the Greater Region can draw on many years of expertise and uh, cross-border cooperation between universities. So on the level of higher education, and is also yeah, a key expert in the current Euro uh, European University initiative. And what is uh, very interesting, as you can see, in these four countries and in this network, there are seven universities, there are three different teaching languages, more than 140,000 students and more than 10,000 lecturers and researchers. But what is also very interesting, and I want to highlight that, that there are 30 different B and three national study programs. And yes, I'm part of one of them. So I'm part of the Master in Border Studies. This is a two years three national master program offered by four universities um, in Germany, France and Luxembourg. And uh, it's a very interdisciplinary master. So there are seven disciplines included. We have also three teaching languages. So German, English and French. And the first and the second semester is in Luxembourg and France and the third semester in Germany. So there's also a high level of mobility. And in the master, we're studying everything that is connected to borders. So borderlands, border areas, cross-border exchange. Yes, so, but what is mostly interesting is, okay, what are the opportunities and challenges of such cross-border education? And I will speak mainly out of my experience as a master student, but you can also see it as an example for a cross-border university, so in general. Yeah, and what is really one of the greatest opportunities to attending such a master is the multicultural and multilingual study experience. So we have a very high level of interdisciplinarity. And also what is very special about our masters that we really have a joint diploma in the end. So the four universities, they really agreed on one joint diploma, not only on a, on a certificate. But what is also very uh, interesting in my case, it's not only that we are studying and learning about borders, border areas, we are also experiencing the border or the border region. So you're becoming as a student yourself a border commuter. And we can also profit uh, in the network of the seven universities of the University of the Greater Region from access to this research network. So as you saw it also over 10,000 lecturers and researchers, but also we have different um, research network within the greater region, for, for example, the UniGR Center for Border Studies, but also um, these cross-border research networks, they're also connected to other research uh, networks in other border regions within the European Union. And what is also very um, helpful for our students is that we can profit from a mobility grant by the uh, Franco-German University so that we can pay for public transport and also partly for housing. Nevertheless, there are great um, opportunities, but we are still facing also a lot of challenges. 
And um, especially administrative obstacles are uh, or is are one of the biggest challenges because uh, students in cross border um, at master programs or uh, bachelor programs they have to enroll themselves at the different universities. So you have really different systems at the universities, and uh, each semester it's a big struggle to get uh, re-enrolled. Also, communication cooperation between the universities still takes a lot of uh, time, so there are longer decision-making paths, uh, especially on an administrative level, and sometimes there are different requirements. For example, at some uh, universities, it's easier when you have, a, for example, social security number from the country, so yeah, there's still um, yeah, a lot of stuff still to do. And also we have difference, especially in our master program between Europeans and third country nationals. So when you're not from the European Union, it's very difficult to attend a, a cross-border a master, a cross-border bachelor regarding visa and housing. And what is also still a challenge is public transport, because since the COVID-19 pandemic, they have reduced um, public transport across borders and sometimes yeah, it's really difficult and it takes a lot of time to get from one university to another. But also on a personal level, um, it's very challenging to be a student uh, in a cross-border uh, education program because you need a high level of personal responsibility uh, regarding organizational skills, but also flexibility and resilience. And also from an academic point of view, you, if you are studying at different universities in different countries, there are different uh, academic requirements, different styles, and also studying in uh, three different languages can be also sometimes a challenge. And uh, yeah, the last point, also the COVID-19 pandemic, um, especially uh, in the first year, the lockdowns, the border closures, it was a really uh, a tough time for uh, cross-border education programs. And also I have started during the um, pandemic, so I had more, or my mobility was more in form of digital mobility, mobility instead of physical mobility. So it's very difficult to orientate yourself when you're doing most of um, the courses uh, remotely. So thank you, uh, merci and thank you for your attention. So if you have um, yeah more, you want to learn more about the University of the Greater Region, just scan the QR code on the left side and also I. Uh, I put a QR code from the from our Instagram page. So yeah, and if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much indeed. And um, we will, if we may, uh, bring the questions into the panel discussion, which uh, happily you're going to join later. But that was fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Um, clearly, this is a a, um, a developing academic discipline and one which it gives a real opportunity for multidisciplinary aspects, but. It's kind of, uh, key, it's an interesting and maybe unique in the sense that as you are studying cross-border uh, issues, you are experiencing them in your personal and uh, personal life at the same time. So it's a practical as well as a academic uh, pursuit and it's fascinating. So thank you very much indeed for that. Let's take a, a second um, contribution. Uh, from uh, those who are involved in education cooperation. Uh, Eniko, Eniko Darabos, uh, lovely to have you with us. Um, uh, you are the um, project coordinator for the um, Build, Buildings Cooperation in the Greats Region, which has the delightful, splendid acronym of BIG. Uh, so would you please tell us something about that um, that in Austria and Hungary, the cooperation there. Yes, thank you very much, Andrew. My name is Anike Dorabos, and um, I will speak about our big projects. Uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, the Department Kindergarten of the Office of uh, the Provincial Government of Lower Austria, which is the lead partner of the big projects. And uh, First of all, I have to say that it's a great honor for us to speak here about our cross-border education uh, project. <clears throat> and um, in fact, we, uh, we are, um, actually we aim to prepare new generations of children 
for such um, MA projects or the programs uh, about uh, Laura was uh, talking about. So uh, our main target group um, are kindergarten and primary school children. And the main uh, program area, as you can see here, is um, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, and uh, of course, uh, Austria, with some of its uh, federal uh, states. Uh, big uh, stands for Bildungskooperation in Grenzregionen, uh, and it um, runs in the Interreg uh, program. And um, we are speaking about three projects for in four countries. And uh, we have uh, 15 project partners, uh, 13 strategic partners. And uh, during the first and the second program period, we have reached over 9,000 uh, children, uh, 160 schools and 270 kindergartens in the region. Uh, as you see, uh, we, we are speaking about three projects. The first is Big In, uh, where In stands for innovative, and it is the hung Hungarian um, with our Hungarian partners. Uh, the second is Big Ling, when Ling stays for uh, linguistic or the uh, language, and it is with a, a Slova Slo Slovakian partner. And Edu STEM is with the Czech Republic. Um, and of course, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and all these uh, skills that uh, refers to this STEM education is uh, important for us. Uh, yes, uh, our main target groups, as I uh, said before, uh, are kindergarten and primary school children. But of course, uh, we, we lay special attention on parents and teachers also. Uh, and school leaders, kindergarten leaders and principals are also in our focus and we are in a constant uh, consultation uh, with them. And um, that's uh, why we have to take into our consideration a bottom-up uh, approach in uh, our project uh, initiatives, because it, it's not to admire that each region has its own special educational profile. So we have to take, uh, take it into the consideration uh, what kind of uh, activities they need what kind of activities we can uh, offer. But our um, top-down um, approach is indeed multilingualism. So um, we would like to promote multilingualism as a, as a fundamental uh, context for this cross-border existing cross-border uh, regions. Uh, that's why we... Um, Keep in mind the educational institutions, the teacher training institutes, the high schools and universities, uh, the professional language teachers also are very important for us. Uh, we have um, um, students in um, teacher training institutes as partners. And of course, um, we, uh, we are in contact with the regional and regional political and educational authorities. And in this slide, we can uh, uh, see our main uh, objectives and results or, the, uh, or uh, products. Um, first of all, um, we lay special attention on developing language skills through learning by doing in the kindergartens. Um, for us, is very important in our uh, activities that um, the children should um, meet the STEM topics as, as early as possible. So in the kindergarten, in their activities in the kindergarten, 
And that's why we um, edited the best practice examples for teachers. We have uh, edited a B-Bot handbook. Uh, the B-Bot is a very uh, cute um, programmable floor robot, which is very useful in kindergarten activities because the kinder because the children can um, um, easily uh, program it and by programming they learn the directions they learn uh, coordination um, they learn uh, also uh, the target language uh, because our native speaker language train train trainees uh, and teachers um, link these uh, activities together. So when we educate uh, STEAM topics in our uh, institute partner institutions, we um, also um, prepare a language acquisition of the children. So the target language is also emphasized. That's why we uh, promote multilingualism and we implement the STEM education in early childhood. And uh, that means that we organize a lot of language sensitive educational activities, uh, also experiments in the kindergartens and science talks about the great questions of the universe and the great questions of, of uh, natural uh, sciences. Um, in our uh, project uh, was a special has a special um, topic of emphasizing extracurricular activities by highlighting the regional potentials of the cross border economic and natural region. That means that in each region of our uh, partners, um, our special institutions, museums, um, natural parks farms that could serve as a um, uh, um, learning um, place for the for the kin for the children and the teacher and we would like we uh, wanted to organize as much education uh, cross border educational trips and tours for preschool children and for teachers as we can but the covid uh, pandemic was also uh, uh, a hard time for us in this regard, and we uh, had to be creative in this regard, and we decided to um, to to make a, a web a website, an online language tour website, which collect these regional potentials and um, and shows those didactical materials that we have. Um, for uh, we have <laughs> worked out uh, in our uh, institutions. And with all these initiatives, we would like to increase the employability of next generations of young adults in the cross-border region. I have collected here some of our uh, products. You can see here the BBOT handbook, which contains multilingual kindergarten activities performed with the BBOT, which develops programming skills and uh, at the same time language skills. Uh, our Vien, uh, partner from Vienna uh, has uh, a pocket dialogues um, edited, edited with this. Uh, very interesting pocket dialogues, which uh, could serve as a multilingual inspiration for science talk, for science talks in kindergartens. So the teacher could have it in its pocket, and when in a, in the kindergarten a, a science talk is needed, then he just take out this pocket dialogues and 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 could ask a question for the children and speak about the STEM topics. Uh, we use also, we are present also online on the learning um, management system, which is a, a learning management system used in uh, Austria, LMS.at. 
and we have a lot of uh, thematic worksheets in STEM education. Uh, and uh, by this, we give onla online practical teaching material for uh, preschool and primary school teachers. We have that also in German and in uh, Hungarian and in Slovakian uh, language. Uh, we have it also, we will have it also in print and, and online. And our Hungarian partner was designed a um, board game, a bilingual board game entitled Treasures of the Language, which could help uh, children learn um, other target languages. It's actually on Hungarian and, and German language, but uh, when uh, the teacher is a, a little bit creative, uh, she or he can, in another language, uh, adapt it to, to another language. Yes, and to speak about uh, added values of our big projects, uh, as you can see, the transfer of best practices and the exchange of experiences between regions is very important for us. Uh, networking of the, um, the civil stakeholders, the, um, the local st stakeholders uh, for us is also very uh, desirable. Uh, we would like to increase the employability of young adults in uh, our cross-border region um, and strengthening the cultural and social competencies by promoting multilingualism. And last but not least, enhance the feeling of solidarity between the nations of the EU. And I say that because when um, uh, the Ukrainian children uh, appeared in our partner institutions, our partner were uh, ready to translate uh, all our materials and our didactical um, materials to help these children in, um, include, in inclusion in the society and to ease their uh, educational uh, adaption. So, that was all that I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your... Benico, thank you very much indeed. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and um, um, you will, uh, would you very kindly make sure that um, your presentation is available on the network website? I'm sure um, many of our colleagues would value the opportunity to look at the structure okay. of what you presented and indeed some of the references to the materials that you've used. I yes. must say, okay. it was... It was, it was a, I mean, it's a very ambitious project, isn't it? And it's uh, fascinating to see it presented. Thank you very much indeed. Thank we have a number of questions, but we're going to bring all the questions into the panel discussion in a moment. Um, but first, I'm going to report our second poll, where you've had an opportunity, everyone, to express a view, which amongst these five options, um, the one that has attracted the most support is the exchange of practices and teaching methods among territories and harmonization of standards and recognition of qualifications that attracts the um, most responses. But also there is uh, significant support both for better preparation of students for the labor markets and competition. Uh, interesting one, we'll come back to that in a moment. And equal opportunities and increase social, intercultural and linguistic skills. Those linguistic skills were a very important thread through what you were describing, Eniko, were they not giving your young people those linguistic skills? So let's turn to the panel discussion. Everybody who has been presenting is going to be joining us in the panel. But additionally, we're delighted to have uh, Tina Delva with us, who is um, working within the European Commission in the unit responsible for higher education. I wonder, Tina, would you, uh, as an introduction to our panel discussion, before we move into a range of subjects, uh, give us uh, your view on how higher education is itself contributing to the cross-border cooperation across Europe? 
Yes, Andrew, thank you for, for passing on the floor. I think from what we have heard already just now, uh, flourishing regions and also cross-border cooperation is key uh, for, for Europe to, to ensure that we can really come to, to economic, social and, and territorial cohesion. Um, more than 30% of the European population lives in border areas. And uh, for, for, for us, it's important really to be able to tackle these common challenges that we are all facing in, in the border regions. Um, so that you can really exploit this untapped uh, potential. So cooperation uh, is key uh, to make sure that we really can come to a harmonious development of the European Union. And um, in, that, in that respect, education is key. Um, then when I, when I can link it to, to my field of, of knowledge, the, the higher education sector, it is key that also in, in cross-border regions, we can offer high quality and inclusive higher education. And this is where from the European side, we, we are uh, helping, um, we are trying to help the higher education sector in making this happen. Uh, we have adopted early this year a European strategy for universities. Uh, covering um, the diverse landscape of higher education institutions across Europe, so also cross-border uh, education. And one of the key objectives of this European strategy for universities is to really strengthen the European dimension of higher education and, and uh, research. This is, of course, first of all, on, on cross-border cooperation, but also goes beyond uh, cooperation uh, between the different regions as well. And I think we already have great examples in the field of higher education of such cross-border cooperation. Uh, we have just heard a representative of the Université de la Grande Région, but think also about, for example, who really have already this institutionalized cooperation across uh, borders. And um, we, we are intending to work together with the higher education sector on these cross-border and, and transnational cooperation issues, making it easier to, to cooperate together. I think we heard before all the barriers that are often still there when uh, cooperating across borders. Uh, for example, when offering joint uh, educational activities or for mobilities of students, of staff. And we have some initiatives in the pipeline, such as, for example, working on um, a joint degree based on, on co-created uh, European criteria that could lead to, to a label for such programs and later also um, to a possible real joint degree based on these co-created criteria. So these are really um, files in, in which we really want to help the sector in moving forward so that it really becomes easier for students uh, and staff to, to, uh, to be educated and to teach uh, across the borders. Uh, inclusion is key as well, as well as the, um, the, the need for the universities also to, to tackle together the, the, the challenges related to the green and the digital transition. And I think based on, on the common challenges that we are often facing in cross-border regions, here also higher education has a key role uh, to play. And to help the higher education sector, we of course have different funding programs um, at our disposal at the European level that can be used by uh, higher education institutions. Um, I, I take as the example the Erasmus Plus program, uh, which can offer ample uh, opportunities here. Um, but Andrew, um, this has a first statement, but uh, happy to also hear from the other speakers. Thank you very much indeed, Tina. And we will bring um, some of the points made in the chat to you in a moment. Um, but if I may just um, go back to uh, our two presenters, Laura and Eniko, and uh, that gave rise to some questions arising in the chat. I just wondered, Laura, perhaps uh, if you were able to um, tell us a bit more. Uh, Ricardo was asking, did the joint offer that is available through the Université de Grand Région did that give you access to learning and give access to others to learning which you would not have had access to in the absence of, of, uh, of the joint offer? Yes, thank you for the question. So I would answer yes, definitely. And yeah, in two aspects, so um, the academic aspect for sure. I mean, you have access to four universities in three different countries. So access to a network of knowledge and also to different libraries, different um, online tools. So on an academic level, definitely. But also for me personally, it was a really good learning process um, 
being a student, uh, being a border commuter, getting to know region, a border region better. And I think I learned a lot about how I organize myself to become flexible, to strengthen also my language skills, my um, yeah, also um, intercultural communication. And I think it, yeah, I grew a lot uh, during these two years, even though a lot of the courses were uh, remotely. But I think it's uh, it's a really a great opportunity for for students to have yes such an access um, and yeah I, I would do it uh, or I would choose the master again definitely. Very good. Can, can I just ask while, while I, I have you for a moment, uh, Dirk uh, I think was asking um, if you could elaborate a little on what what are the administrative obstacles because he was feeling that. Um, things like the uh, mutual recognition of um, uh, access requirements between the universities was probably now sorted. What, what, but in terms of administration, where are those problems arising? Yes, so I can only speak from my experience uh, as a master's student in border studies. So I cannot speak for the whole uh, university of the greater region. But um, yeah, for our master program, you have to enroll every semester in each university again. So you have a main university, so minus the um, Saarland University, but nevertheless, you have to enroll at uh, the other universities. And you have also four uh, student cards and you have to use them when you go to the library in Luxembourg, you go with your Luxembourgish uh, student um, card. So uh, I don't know if it's specific also because we have this joint degree that it's also necessary that we have to enroll our, ourselves at all four universities, but there's uh, for sure potential to make the enrollment process easier, also especially for students that are um, third country nationals. So also in our master, we have students from uh, outside the European Union and for them, it's um, yeah a big, big struggle to to profit also from um, from this cross border master program. Right. But it's it's might be it might be interesting to exchange also with the University of the Greater Region for sure. There might be some exchange already, and that yeah, it has to get better. That, that's for I think sure. That, that's quite an important area for for you, Tina, isn't it? The 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 issue of the ability of students to be able to be um, registered with a number of institutions when they're undertaking this kind of cross-border activity. Yeah, indeed. I think what Laura mentioned, uh, it, it doesn't come to, to a surprise to us. And if it is the case, I, I don't think it is really a problem of the University of La Grande Région. Uh, I think there is really a work of national regulations in place, which makes sense if you look at them individually. But then when combining them together, and especially if you're combining more than two universities, the larger your, your, your alliance becomes and the more universities you want to involve in your joint educational activities, the more administrative burdensome it can come. And universities across Europe are doing all what they can to ease it for, for their students. But sometimes within the regulatory frameworks of their member states, these kind of administrative uh, inefficiencies may occur. And this is why um, we, we have announced in our European strategy for universities that we really uh, want to work uh, on a joint degree based on co-created European criteria, which would make it easier to to get registered to get to get recognized um, but we are at the start of the process to really make it easy because currently already a lot of tools exist namely from the bologna tools um, which which ease the recognition and the quality assurance of those programs but we often see still um, an, an uneven application in the member states and there are still many um, national requirements on top of that. So we are uh, working together currently with the stakeholders and the member states to, to ease those processes in the future. Uh, but we still have some work ahead uh, to make this happen because as you may know, the organization of the, um, of the higher education is a competence of the member states. Um, so, and there are sometimes really justified reasons to, to have certain uh, constraints in place. Think about certain language requirements etc which of course are very valuable as well in terms of multilingualism but it's just uh, we, we need to find a balance in in having uh, requirements in place and easing uh, transnational um, uh, cross-border educational activities 
That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Eniko, could I just, um, in, uh, a question was raised uh, uh, by Ricardo while you were talking, which I thought was a really interesting one. Which, Perhaps you could say, what, what were the reaction of teachers? How have teachers, because clearly you're reaching to many educational institutions in four countries, how are teachers responding to this opportunity? Yes, um, the teachers are very inspired, I think, because um, uh, in Austria, in the Austrian kindergartens, uh, we have to, to be, we, we, were, we are able to send uh, Czech, Slovakian, and Hungarian teachers. So the Austrian kind, uh, children learn Czech, Slovakian, and Hungarian. And that's very, very interesting. And uh, the children uh, love it also because they can play, not a learning process. It's a playing process, a learning by playing, a learning by doing. So I think that, that uh, it's a great success in the Thank kindergartens. You. Our project. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Jean-Pierre, in, um, in the discussion um, on the second poll, quite a number of our colleagues said that preparing young people for fast changing labour markets was quite important. I just wondered if um, you might tell us what, what is the European Union able to do to promote um, cross-border opportunities for training, vocational training, not just the, obviously the, the language skills are important in themselves, but beyond that, of course, there are there is the ability, which we've discussed previously, for people to take employment crossing over borders. Um, but of course, they need the appropriate qualifications and skills for that. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, first of all, I would like to really thanks uh, uh, both Eniko and Laura for the illustration on uh, what can be offered in terms of cross-border education. Um, what can the Commission do in order to uh, facilitate this cross-border education? I think I already alluded to in my introduction with uh, two ways. Uh, the first way is uh, through the programs. As you know, they are there is nearly 6 billion euro, which is dedicated to cross-border cooperation within the European Union. So that's, that's quite a massive amount of money that can be harnessed in order to uh, help achieving that goal. And, and the signal is really to uh, then understand what are the obstacles that require a support that goes beyond funding. We heard about a lot of administrative obstacles, and, and there we, we see that sometimes uh, we need to push to have the political will to lift those obstacles. Um, and I think also that through also the, the testimony we had, um, we also understand that there is one important element that has to be also created and which is being created by uh, the two uh, projects that were presented is to make sure that people are feeling comfortable to uh, go across the border to study and to work. And that, I think this is also the human factor, which is uh, extremely important. I'm here sitting in Bayonne at the, at the, with the, uh, the annual meeting of the LAMOT, uh, Mission Operationnelle uh, uh, Transfrontalière, together with also the first meeting of the uh, Journée Transfrontalière in France. So it was attended also at high level by the French. And by chance, we discussed also that aspect that if you are not able, when you cross the border, to find your way easily, to engage with people, to uh, when doing your shopping, when, when going into a restaurant, into a library, then it will remain an obstacle to a real uh, transformation of living in the border region from living to a cross border territory. And this is what we, what we want to speak about that uh, the border should somehow disappear so that we are living in a cross border territory where there are people, let's say, um, who have been educated in different language, different cultural background that we are going to recognize, understand, but certainly uh, where we will feel also comfortable. And, and I think this is really the purpose, let's say, very transparent or apparent in the discussion we've had. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, clearly from the conversation we've been hearing, both from Anne and from Laura, uh, cross-border practitioners is increasingly becoming a, a discipline in itself, understanding how these cross-border opportunities are um, to be created and putting in place the projects to make it happen. 
Uh, Jean-Pierre, do you think um, that the MOOC is, is fostering, and Anne might like to come in on this as well, is it fostering a new generation of cross-border practitioners? Uh, are we seeing the building of a whole new set of, um, not just experts, but practitioners? Jean-Pierre. At least I hope so. Uh, certainly, uh, we are in a fast changing world, and I think also you know, the young people are um, seeing their life uh, as maybe uh, not always in the same country, not in the same job neither. So I think the MOOC is also responding to this uh, existing aspiration. Um, I would like to hear then the, 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 uh, the let's say the contribution of Anne, but we have an ambition there clearly, and uh, now we need to make sure that we deliver. And do you think you're creating a whole new body of expertise across Europe? Well, I, I hope so. <laughs> but um, in fact, it, it was very interesting in the first session to see that not that much students registered. It was uh, people who already had five to 10 years experience and not only in European uh, territorial cooperation, but who were new sometimes in this field or who, wants, uh, who wanted to uh, have more knowledge uh, on, on this. So um, it might also be uh, something that is inspiring for uh, people in order maybe to change uh, uh, their jobs or uh, something like that. But I think, uh, in fact, uh, it's uh, the idea of uh, really uh, gaining competences, building capacities. And um, what is the difference between the first and the second session? In the first uh, session, we really wanted all the people following the four chapters. We opened every week uh, another chapter uh, because we thought it's uh, it's really important that everybody had the whole overview of uh, the different topics uh, we worked on. But um, in the evaluation, we also saw that some people are really interested in one topic or the other topic or uh, uh, expertise in one uh, field, for example, health or uh, project management, and um, that they want to pick some of the uh, of the uh, learning materials and so this time for the second session we decided to open all the chapters at the same time and so uh, yesterday and so we hope uh, for the people to um, be able to respond to this attempt that is uh, to pick just what they need but also to uh, give them the opportunity to have the whole overview of uh, European territorial cooperation. Thank you. Um, Tina, I wonder if I might uh, come to you. The first poll, if you recall, um, the, the largest number of our participants felt that what was really going to make the um, biggest difference would be designing cross-border education programs with an international and multilinguistic approach. In the higher education context, uh, Enigra, I'll come to you in a moment as well to see this from the, from the school point of view, but... Um, do, do you see across Europe that educational institutions are wanting to get together to create that, um, going beyond uh, Erasmus Plus? Clearly, Erasmus Plus has an immense positive impact for the young people themselves and their ability to access education across Europe. But um, that doesn't necessarily create the cross-border programming with the linguistic opportunities and, um, and the combined programs. Are the educational institutions perhaps putting together these programs more now? Uh, yes, that's indeed what we see uh, on the ground because you have to be aware that Erasmus Plus, it's more than only student and staff uh, mobility. This is, of course, the component that is most known to, to the wider public, but it also has uh, a large component on, on transnational cooperation between higher education institutions and also cooperation between uh, higher education institutions and their ecosystem partners. So this can be uh, public authorities, this can be companies, it can be civil society. So even within Erasmus+, Plus, there are ample funding opportunities to put together joint educational uh, activities. And even with third countries, for example, to the Erasmus uh, Joint Mundus. And what we see in, in, in the past years, in, in the is that there is, um, that there is a, an increased interest of the higher education sector to pool their efforts together and to come forward with, with uh, joint educational programs. Also in view of remaining competitive 
also in, in a changing uh, education landscape. Um, think also about increased international competition for, 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 the, for the highly ranked universities. Think about the UK universities, the American universities. So by pooling together their strengths, universities across Europe can really also be stronger together and, and really offer both inclusive and quality uh, education. Oh, that's very interesting. Enika, I, I, I was interested also to hear about how the schools, uh, perhaps at the uh, an earlier stage before higher education, how are the schools responding in terms of their ability to create shared programmes? I think that in, in this regard, uh, we have to disseminate a lot of uh, our results and products to to get known. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, cross-border uh, programs and the need, as, as in the first poll we have seen, the need is there. So we, we, we should organize a lot of cross-border educational programs. And I think that uh, when the schools feels the possibility, feels the, the, the future uh, gifts of these actions, I think that they will be uh, cooperative and they will back up such initiatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a number of, on chat, we have some uh, very helpful points that have been made. Uh, Eniko, you've kindly responded um, yes. uh, on one relating to the training and workshops for um, kindergarten teachers. Thank you. People can see that there. Uh, and we're also hearing from uh, Kate Triona in uh, who is drawing attention to the B Solutions initiative of DG Regio and the Association of European Border Regions to help institutions to access expertise. So that's uh, very helpful too. Thank you for that. Um, I just thought, um, uh, Anne, before we have to close uh, the poll, I just wondered if, if, um, if it, your experience is that uh, the educational uh, standards and programs, the qualifications are going to be able to be harmonised to an extent. Because often one of the obstacles, the, admitted, the obstacles to educational cooperation is that there are um, different awarding bodies. At the higher education level, often universities are themselves the awarding bodies, so they can cooperate more effectively. But for schools, they're often not in that they're not in a simple um, position of being able to cooperate. They may be constrained by the, um, the rules and the structures of the educational awarding bodies to whom they work. Um, I wondered if that had in practice, do you think from your study of these uh, issues, is that an, an issue, an obstacle to the cross-border cooperation? Well, um... I'm not a, a, an expert in this question, but from my experience, it is, um, well, it, it might be an obstacle, but there is way to overcome it. Because if you want to, um, to do a cross-border cooperation, also at primary school or secondary school, as we heard from, from Eniko, there, there are possibility to do so. Of course, to have a joint degree or um, this is something else. And this is also a, a question of, of uh, national government uh, willing to, uh, to, to do so, of course, um, but uh, which I think is very important. And this uh, throughout the education from kindergarten to higher education and uh, also when you are uh, uh, looking for, for a job is um, this uh, language competences of course and also intercultural competences uh, because there uh, this is not something that is in the regular uh, curriculum at least for intercultural competences and uh, from our experience it's not only um, we are also mainly working with higher education and it's not only something that is important for social sciences or uh, people willing to work in the cross-border cooperation but it's uh, also very important for uh, other types of students for example we're uh, working with um, many uh, um, programs for uh, engineers, uh, for example, because it's uh, the idea 
idea of making this uh, uh, cross-border uh, uh, employment vision also to, to, to be able to look for a job on the other side of the border, even if you are not dealing with cross-border cooperation, but just to have the opportunity to look uh, beyond the, the, the border for, uh, for a job, to make this uh, uh, border as a chance and not as an obstacle, even if after that, there might be some administrative obstacle or uh, now very, uh, uh, very important uh, for cross-border employment, this home office uh, topic. But, uh, but still, it's uh, to look at the border as an opportunity. And this is also going through uh, accompaniment of, of uh, students and, uh, and, um, and the younger people through this intercultural compliance, I think. Thank you, Anne. That's really interesting. Um, I fear, as ever, with these uh, discussions, time is against us because we always find the discussions broaden and uh, we could take uh, many more issues up, but uh, time is against us. Can I just say, uh, in the chat, there is an, uh, an interesting um, opportunity, which I think is being uh, there from uh, Katriona and Marianne, saying about the opportunity to uh, put forward proposals under the B Solutions Initiative of DG Regio. Uh, and she says there is a call for proposals which attendees can hear about at an information session starting uh, just literally in, in 25 minutes after our discussion this morning. So do have a look on chat if that would be uh, important and helpful to you. Can I just say before I... Um, uh, ask Jean-Pierre to say a few words by way of conclusion. Can I just say a big thank you to all of our panellists uh, who have responded uh, very well and uh, in the most interesting way to the questions that have been raised through the chat function uh, and indeed to our poll results. As ever, uh, our team, the, the Border Focal Point Network and the team at DG Regio will be um, taking advantage of all of the information that's being presented today and making it available through the website uh, and other routes. Um, can I just remind anybody who can give us a bit more information about the topics that they would wish uh, to discuss in future events, can you put that up on the chat and let us know um, some of your experience of participating in these debates. They have been fascinating debates and we look forward to uh, further events uh, in the future, which will be notified through the uh, website. So do please keep very close eye on all of the network information. Uh, and uh, I can see that Ramses is giving us all um, opportunities through the chat to link to all of those um, notifications. So you can get those notifications uh, through to you. Thank you to, uh, to, to Tina for um, uh, your contribution to Laura and to Eniko, really useful, um, very full in, and, and uh, interesting discussion of the, your projects. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Anne and good luck with the MOOC, which started just yesterday. And can I just, uh, from me, just hand over to Jean-Pierre to bring our discussion to a conclusion today. Jean-Pierre. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you all. Um, in my conclusion, I will I would like to echo what uh, Anne said: is that uh, our goal is to make sure that uh, border regions are not characterized by the obstacles that we are seeing in uh, border regions, but by the fact that borders can become an opportunity to do more. And this is what we we heard today. Um, I would like to add also um, my own experience in, in terms of multilingual and also multicultural uh, education is that when you know uh, more cultures, uh, often you have also a mind which is open to find more solutions to issues. Sometimes whenever you are educated in a single culture, you tend to see solutions only in one direction. And when, when you are open to more perspectives, then certainly it, it creates more creativity. Uh, in addition to uh, elements which are quite obvious is that whenever you consider that territories are going across a border, you have a larger pool of expertise, you have a larger uh, work market, uh, you have uh, many things which are for sure much better. Um, last point which is making this topic even more important today is that um, 2023 uh, will be uh, a, spe a special year with a team. And it will be the European year of skills. And for sure, education is very much behind the creation of skills. So 
this topic will remain uh, very high. Um, and uh, to refer to uh, something which is also at the center of what we discussed today is that um, we have really the ambition of creating borders that are unifying Europe, but also territories of opportunities. And uh, this is the rationale of uh, the B solutions. So uh, we are managing funds, but we are also looking beyond funding with uh, the border focal point, the border focal network, the B solutions, and we are working on that with the Association of European Border Regions. Everyone there is putting in the same direction. And uh, for me, it has been a great introduction uh, to this topic. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Thank you to your team, uh, to Ramesses and all of your colleagues. Uh, and thank you to our panelists and not least a very big thank you to all of the participants uh, and it's been a great to have you here really fascinating discussion this morning thank you all very much indeed